over um, uh, that theme, and then it, the majority of his talk will be Hanya. Um, so right here, obviously, this is the island of Crete. And on the far eastern side, we have La Sithi. And La Sithi, basically, you guys can um, segment into three different areas where the traditions are, the musical instrumentation is a little bit different. Um, the far, far eastern tip, we have Sithia. Um, towards Ayunicola, that area, Kritza Krusta, that's uh, Mirambelu. And if you go a little bit further to the west, you have the Oropedio, la, the La Sithi Oropedio, the plateau. And that area is very similar. And then you go due south onto the coast and we get to the Irapetra region, which again, the dancing is basically the same, but the musical instrumentation has evolved a little bit differently in each area. Um, we're gonna go to Sitia first. And this is basically the original Lira of Crete and specifically from the La Sithi Sitia region called the Liraki. If you notice the bow um, with the doxari, with the little bells, it's called the Yerakokuduna. And so this was basically the instrumentation that carried the music and the dancing for a very long time in this area. It was a lot of times just played by itself. Um, the bells basically enhanced the music and kind of gave depth and layers to the music and obviously to the dancing as well. So this basically was the original instrumentation to the area predating from what Nico told me, the Venetian um, period of Crete. Um, over time then, what uh, came with, accompanied with that was the Dauli or the Daulaki. And so that's kind of the original sound that you started hearing from Sitia and to all of La Siti. So what I'm gonna do now, you guys, is basically to compare each region, you're gonna hear Pidikta from uh, Sitia, uh, Mirambelu, and from Mirapetra, and basically see how the sound is different for each area. And, and the dancing kind of, changes a little bit with the instrumentation from each area. So let me pull up my YouTube. We're gonna first go to the Sitia region. I don't know if you guys can hear this. You guys can see the Liraki and the Daulaki right there. Another really good piece is this one over here. So really in this area, it was a lot of Tidikta, Candades, singing Rizitika as well. I'm going to show you guys also a modern piece from a recent performance from a group. basically the sound of that area. Um, let me go back to, whoops, not my messages, sorry. So now we're gonna go a little bit further to the west, sorry, that was Steven. Uh, once you get now towards the Oropedio Mirambelu area, they did use Liraki, but also now you have the introduction of the Ascomandura, which again, the Oropedio, that area, you're towards the Dicti Mountains of La Siti. So a lot of the Vosqui there, were using Ascomandura as sound. So when they were dancing, they would do um, Ascomandura by themselves. And then later on, they would introduce the Ascomandura with the uh, Dauli as well, as well. So I have a couple of um, really good clips to hear the instrumentation from that area. Uh, let's go down here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, yeah, no, video's not great, but you can hear the sound really well with the Eskimo beard on the dolly as well. Again, they're all dancing the pedicol, whether it's called Sipiapo pedicol, La Sipiotico pedicol, you have Sipiotico pedicol, they're all the same dance. And another piece here is Pendozali Ascomandura with uh, no accompaniment, just the Ascomandura. Again, Pendozali, Ascomandura from Oropedio, La City. From the Oropedio area, let's go back to the slides. Hold on, I'll get to that. Now we've had the evolution from Liraki, now we have Lira or Violo Lira. And this is basically the Lira that's kind of known throughout Crete. So it's kind of evolved now from the smaller lira instrument to the more traditional one that you guys are familiar with. And from the Oropedio Mirambelu area, uh, Andonis Vardas um, has been kind of like a forefront, like the main person, lirari from this area. And I have a couple of clips from him playing. And again, you can hear the different sound from the liraki with the kudunya to just the regular lira. And we have him over here, I think. You'll notice here that this is the first time you're seeing a lauto, whereas before in Sitia and parts of Mirambelu, Oropedio, they did not have lauto. Now lauto is getting introduced into this part of La City as an accompaniment. Again, you can still have a dauli here, but this is really the first time that you're seeing a lauto, which is a relatively new instrumentation since probably after World War II that was introduced to the music, um, especially in the La City area of Crete. <laughs> So there we have the lira, the viola lira. Oops, sorry, I keep putting up Stephen there. And then finally, the and here's the difference, another slide which is nice. It shows the difference between the liraki on the left and the viola lira, the regular lira on the right. So you kind of can see that the sizing is a little bit different. The bells are on the doxari and again, providing a different sound between those two regions of La City. The final different um, instrumentation that we have is south in Irapetra, and we have that, the violin. And here we have um, Vardakis and Dermizoyanis, who are both um, violinists from that area. Uh, Vardakis on the left is from Irapetra. Dermizoyani is actually from Siti, and he actually would play both instruments, but he was very skilled in the violin as well. And here you can hear, again, another different sound and richness to the music. If I can find that right here. This is the Mizoyani. Another violinist, Zandakis. And 
And then finally we have um, Vardakis right here. My favorite Yid is my of this uh, song. So basically, you guys, that's the three different kind of sounds and instrumentation throughout La City. Just to review, we have Sitia in the far east, and then we have Mirambelu. Uh, Oropedio further west, and then we have um, uh, Irapetra further south. So if I can just get my slides back up here. Here we go. So three different sounds. Again, the dancing is the same steps, again, but the pattern or the, the, the style and the footwork in terms of, it, it gets influenced by the sound of the music from all three regions. Um, another instrument that's kind of been lost but trying to make a comeback is the um, Fiamboli or the Floyera. Um, and I have a very nice piece here um, of a guy playing a song called Vulgari, which is um, kind of a lost song and dance of Crete. Uh, let's go to that one. And where did it go? Uh, hold on one second. I think it's this next one. Here it is. And the floyera, you guys would be played by itself, or again, it could be accompanied by a dauli. So Again, just kind of a really quick, brief um, overview of the instrumentation and involution and the, um, in the sounds of La City. Um, I'm going to quickly go now and touch a little bit towards Iraklio. So let's pull up Iraklio here on the map. So Iraklio now is in between La City to the right and Rathimno to the left. Um, and again, Iraklio is very, very varied from Castri up at the top, which is the capital, Moho to the right of Iraklio, then you head south into the um, Siloritis range, which you have Yeriri over here. And then further south here, it's not labeled Ethia, is under by Pirgo, but this whole area in the south coast is Asterusia, which Asterusia is kind of a hybrid region between La City and the rest of Iraklio. Um, we'll quickly just touch base with um, Yeriri. Obviously, Yeriri is known for the Ascomandura. And um, again, it's a very mountainous region, there's a lot of shepherds, Bosqui. So, the Ascomandura, just like the other islands in the Lodecanisa, the Pitsambuna, it's the instrument of choice in that area. The Ascomandura could be played either solo or a lot of times it was accompanied with a dauli. It would be accompanied with a lira as well and the lauto also, which was a little bit more prevalent in um, Iraklio. The uh, Ascomandura and Yeriri, they would play all the songs there, whereas in La City, you just saw in the Pidikta here, you they'd play all the Pidikta with Ascomandura, the Pendozaya, the Sirta, the, the Sigano with all the accompanying condillas would sometimes be all done with just Ascomandura. Um, a couple clips to show you guys over here with the sound instrumentation. This one already started. Sifakis is the very well known um, Ascomandura player. And going a little bit more modern now for today. Kostimu Zurakis is a, again very well known uh, modern Ascomandura player today in Crete. Accompanied with 
ਦਾ ਦਾਉ ਲੇ and Nurom Bojanaki another very well known Askomangora player What I like about this clip you guys is that it shows both the Ascomandura and the Lira being played at the same time so you're kind of getting a mix of sound and instrumentation and depth to the music. So again that's kind of the the main uh sound and focus of yeri yeri in that accompanying region right underneath the psilorithis range um just to quickly on um, here's a nice piece with um hearing the sirto ascomandora all right guys i'm going to quickly just fly through asterusia um and again asterusia doesn't have you know they do the lira over there but i wanted to show you guys um if i can get my slide up here we go so in asterusia you guys they have lira they have mandolino and if you look at the entrance to the left it's the mandola which is kind of a hybrid lauto mandolin um instrument which is really not seen anymore um i know they still have some uh copies of the, those instruments but um this is the only place i saw it was in asterusia um the lira over here you have four of them the second one is from Lirazaki the one of the foremost Ethiopian lira players and it's kind of like a hybrid lira violi and underneath here you have a mandolin so this was pretty typical for Asterusia um and you can actually see uh Lirazaki here on the left with the violi lira and then Carcavazzos here has the man mandola um let me just play a couple of clips and then I will turn this over to Nico. So just to kind of hear what the mandola sounded like. That's all Lirazaki, Lirazaki. Here's the mandola. And then just real quick guys just one more clip cuz I really like Lirazaki. <laughs> so from Lirazaki you guys um he's the one that kind of came up or discovered the tune that would match the Malevijoti to Lirazaki or as it's also known as the Asterusiano Pedicto. So again just to review we did La City three regions and then two regions central Iraqli or Yeri and southern Iraqli Asterusia. So um sorry guys this was very quick. Um if anyone is interested I have many videos and write-ups and uh books on this material. So again Stacy thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed um presenting this to you guys. Thanks so much, Bobby. That was awesome. And I know it's so hard to fit so much in. Um, and I, I would just want to reiterate that all of this is going to be um, given to you guys later so you can go back and watch it. And you're obviously, I know, I know Bobby and he'd be more than welcome to, um, to hearing from you if you wanted to go dive deeper into that. I also want to let you know when you get the recordings, you're going to also get the transcript of the chat. Um, so I know Joe's written a couple of things and there are things that might be of interest to you. So make sure to pay attention to those, but I'll turn it over to Nicola now and, and let him enlighten us. Λοιπόν, καλησπέριζω όλη την παρέα. Hello everybody. Ε, η δική μου η τιμή, Stacy, που είμαι στην παρέα σας απόψε. Απλά επειδή είναι πρώτη φορά που συμμετέχω, θα ήθελα τη βοήθεια του Μπάμπη, αν μπορείς να το ανοίξω το μικρόφωνο, στην... Μετάφραση. 
Okay. I think my microphone is on, right, Stacey? Ωραία. Ωραία. Για πρώτη φορά θα ήθελα να μιλήσω έτσι αυτόν τα γελεύθερα να μην πιέζομαι από την γλώσσα. Ε, επίσης, επειδή δεν είναι, δεν είναι το επάγγελμα αυτό που κάνω, δεν είμαι τόσο οργανωμένος ε, από άποψη αρχείων, με εικόνα και ήχο, και πιο πολύ θα σας μιλήσω ε, ε, για αυτά που ξέρω από την ε, σχέση που έχω ε, με όλα αυτά ο ίδιος προσωπικά, βιωματικά. So Nico's going to basically talk about what he, you know, what he's most um, vested in, basically, and that's going to be the Hanya region of Crete. Ωρα. Τα όργανα στην περιοχή των Χανίων είναι ακριβώς τα ίδια με αυτά που έδειξε ο Μπάμπης για να μην τα ξαναδείχνουμε. Βιολί, λύρα και λαούτο είναι τα βασικά όργανα, the main instruments. Βιολί, λύρα και λαούτο. Yes. The main instruments in the region of Hanya is λύρα, βιολί and λαούτο. But also in Hanya, Uh, dominant place has the Rizitico song, except the uh, instruments. We have a long uh, tradition with the Rizitica song, we, which uh, have a, a main place in the Cretan, uh, in the Glendi of Hania, and και σε κάποια μέρη του Ρεθύμνου Μπάμπελα, κυρίως στα Χανιά. So um, what Nico was basically saying in a nutshell is that, you know, they have the, the instruments, they also have the singing tradition in Hania, The Rizitika, or the, the singing tradition, which also kind of morphed a little bit into Rethimno as well, but it's mostly concentrated in Hanya. Agrivos. Και θα ήθελα να ακούσουμε ένα δείγμα. Ακούγεται. Αυτό είναι το ένα δείγμα από ριζίτικο. Είναι ένα τραγούδι κυρίω που αναπτύχθηκε στην περιοχή των Λευκών Ωραίων, αλλά έπιασε όλο τον Ομογανίο, ακόμα και τα παράλια και μπήκε και στην περιοχή του Ρεθίμνου. Yeah, it basically started in the, the White Mountains of the Λευκά Ωρή Mountain Range of Χανιά, which is in the central part of the Χανιά Νομό, and it basically then spread out through all of Χανιά to the coastal areas both north, south and west. Και εξακολουθεί και σήμερα να έχει κυρίαρχη θέση στο Γλέντι. Έχουμε στα Χανιά τραγουδάμε πολύ ριζίτικα. Δεν χορεύουμε και δεν έχουμε μόνο μουσική. Έχουμε πάρα πολύ ριζίτικο. Basically, the main, especially, you know, the Rizinia area of Χανιά, spreading out, you know, the singing tradition was much more prevalent than the dancing tradition, especially with yeah. the mountains of the Λευκάωρη. Ακριβώς. Ε... Το ριζίτικο, από ό,τι φαίνεται, έχει τις ρίζες του πάρα πολύ παλιά, πολύ πριν τα όργανα. Πολύ πριν έρθουν τα μουσικά όργανα, έχει τις ρίζες του το τραγούδι στα Χανιά, το ριζίτικο. Um, the, the ριζίτικα, basically, have much more, almost ancient origins in Χανιά. Ωραία. Μετά πάμε στην εμφάνιση του βιολιού, τον 18ο αιώνα περίπου. We're going to go towards, uh, talk about the violin now. Εμφανίστηκε το 18ο αιώνα, Μπάμπη, το 1700 περίπου στα, στα Χανιά. 1700. Ναι, ναι, ναι. The violin was introduced around the 1700s, um, possibly with the entrance of the Venetians, um, or prior to when the Venetians came to Crete. Και ε, ξεκίνησε από τα αστικά κέντρα της μεγάλης πόλης και μετά πήγε στα χωριά. It started basically the main towns in Crete were in the coastal areas and then spread and diffused into the countryside and mountain areas of um, Crete as well. Το ίδιο περίπου συνέβη και στο Λασίθι. Σε αυτά τα δύο άκρα της Κρήτης, Χανιά και Λασίθι, αναπτύχθηκε πάρα πολύ το βιολί από τις μεγάλες πόλεις πέρα στα χωριά. The violin was definitely more concentrated on the ends of the islands, Λασίθι and Χανιά, possibly because, you know, the Venetians were, you know, big into the shipping, the way they traveled, so they probably hit those areas first before they got into the central mountainous areas of Crete. Και ο λόγος είναι ότι είναι ένα όργανο με τέσσερις χορδές, είχε περισσότερες δυνατότητες στην απόδοση της μελωδίας. Ήταν πιο μελωδικό όργανο, πιο πλούσιο όργανο. A richer sounding instruments with, uh, with four chords, 
is characteristic of the violin? Να βάλουμε να ακούσουμε ένα δείγμα από βιολί μπαμπί. He's going to play an example of a violin from Χανιάνα, which is different from Λασίθι. Μισό λεπτό να δω. Ένα δείγμα. Να καταλάβουμε έτσι περίπου τον ήχο. Ακούγεται νομίζω έτσι. Είναι πολύ χαρακτηριστικό αυτό το κομμάτι. Εδώ παίζει ο Μιχάλης ο Κουνέλης με τον Μανώλη τον Καρτσόνη. Είναι ο Μιχάλης ο Κουνέλης με τον Μανώλη τον Καρτσόνη και παίζουν τον Χανιώτη Κοσυρθό τον πρώτο. Ο βιολίνος εδώ παίζει τον πρώτο Συρθό, τον πρώτο Συρθό. Uh, which is said that became from the last uh, soldiers of uh, the Constantinople, the Cretan soldiers of Constantinople. Uh, folklore has it. The oral that tradition, okay, says that uh, they care, they carried the melody from the from the Constantinople to Hania. And uh, it's important that this melody, who has this history, is uh, the most important melody, and today, for the Cretan Glendi, all over Crete. <laughs> when the Glendi starts, uh, every Glendi starts uh, usually with Sirtos, and with this Sirtos, the Protus Hanioticos. So it's uh, the history of this uh, uh, song is very heavy for us, okay? Uh, Meta, uh, οι συνθέσεις των πρώτων βιολιστών, οι οποίες χρονολογούνται μπάμπι από το 1750 και μετά, mm. το βιολί πέρασε και στα χέρια ε, άλλων καλλιτεχνών, όπου μέχρι σήμερα ε, έχει περάσει σε νέα παιδιά και εξακολουθεί την ε, σημαντική της ιστορία. Έχουμε μια αναβίωση του βιολιού τα τελευταία χρόνια. Okay, that was a lot to take in. So basically, after 1750, the violin kind of in the Hanya went down generation, generation, Um, to how it's evolved today, from what I think he said. Και έχει καταφέρει να βάλει στη μελωδία και στοιχεία του ορεινού πολιτισμού, του βουνού, και αλλά και στοιχεία της θάλασσας από μελωδική άποψη ενώ. So the melody for the violin, you know, will be a little bit different from the inland regions of Χανιά. The sound is a little different as opposed to the coastal regions of Χανιά, especially towards Kisamo and the far west coast of Χανιά. Άρα, επομένως, το βιολί έχει μια πολύ μεγάλη ιστορία, ενώ το λαού του μπήκε στις αρχές του 19ου αιώνα και στα Χανιά και στο Ρέθιμνο. Πότε μπήκε, Νίκο, πια... Αρχές, αρχές του 20ου αιώνα, το 1900 και μετά. Το λαού του έκανε την αρχή, κάτω όπως είπα πριν, στην τραγική μουσική, μετά από τις 1900, βασικά. Η βασική, τα βασικά όργανα, επομένως, στον ομοχανίων, το βιολί, το λαούτο και πολύ λίγο το θιαμπόλι, η φλογέρα, πάρα πολύ λίγο, σε, σε λίγες περιοχές, κυρίως σε ορεινές περιοχές. Basically, the φλογέρα, like I touched on, also has an appearance in Χανιά, but very, very slight and not, not too prevalent. So we have violin, lute and rizitica song. This is the tradition of Χανιά. Uh, Religion. Uh, if we were to go to Rethimno, uh, we have the lira as, as a main instrument, okay? But uh, lira has a, a long story. Uh, η lira, Bobby, πιθανολογείται ότι ήρθε από τους uh, Άραβες ή από τους Βυζαντινούς. Δεν είναι εξακριβωμένο. They're not quite sure who introduced um, the lira, if, whether it was the Arabs possibly during the Sadakin period in the 9th century, or if it was an indigenous, or if the Byzantine Romans had brought it to the island as well. Κυριαρχεί στην περιοχή του Ρεθύμνου και στην βόρεια περιοχή του Ιρακλείου, η λύρα. 
in the northern part of Retino and northern part of Iraklio the Lira. Ε, μπορούμε να ακούσουμε ένα κομμάτι από, το, από τη λύρα από τον ε, Μουντάκη, χαρακτηριστικό. Uh, he's going to play a piece from Costa Mundaki, who has the pieces from Svakia, but um, was based out of Northern Rathimno. <laughs> Λύρα και λαούτο, πολύ καθαρός ήχος. Ωραία. Είναι χαρακτηριστικό και ενδιαφέρον ότι στην ανατολική πλευρά των Χανίων, στην περιοχή του Αποκόρονα. In the, east, the far northeastern part of the Νομοχανίων in the Αποκόρονα region. Αναπτύχθηκε πολύ η Λύρα. The Λύρα was much more prevalent there. The violin kind of faded out quickly and Λύρα took hold. And it's probably the only region in Χανιά that is more Λύρα based than violin based. Ναι. Και είναι επίσης ενδιαφέρον, μια και είμαστε στο meeting αυτό, ότι μεγάλοι καλλιτέχνες της Λύρας πήγαν στην Αμερική και έπαιξαν Λύρα. A lot of the Apokorona musicians actually jumped to the United States in the early 20th century or so. The Lira players from Greek America were from actually Apokorona. Όπως ο Χαρίλαος ο Πιπεράκης ή Χαρίλαος Δεκρέταν, Χαρίλαος Πιπεράκης ο Χαρίλαος Δεκρέταν, and Γιώργης Καντέρης ο Καντερογιώργης, who also was in America. Ακούγεται με ο Καντεράκης. Είναι μια ηχογράφηση του 1925 σε αμερικάνικη εταιρεία, στην εταιρεία Victor, από δίσκο της εταιρείας Victor στην Αμερική του 1925. 1925. Ναι, ναι, αυτή η ηχογράφηση που μόλις ακούσαμε. 1925, από American recording um, group, Victoria. Ωραία. Ε, ο Αποκόρονας ήταν κοντά με το Ρέθυμνο, γι' αυτό ε, πάρα πολλοί ρεθυμιώτες λιράριδες, ρεθυμιώτες λιράριδες, του 20ου αιώνα, επηρεάστηκαν πολύ από τον Αποκόρονα και τη μουσική του Αποκόρονα. Πάρα πολλές συνθέσεις του Μουντάκη του Σκορδαλού είναι Αποκορονιώτικες. A lot of the Rathimian Lira traditions actually have um, raises or roots in the Αποκόρονα region of Χανιά, which again mm-hmm. is a kind of hybrid region that seeps from Χανιά towards the Rathimno. Στο Rathimno, επειδή η Λύρα περιζόταν, περιζόταν περισσότερο σαν κύριο όργανο, βγήκαν μετά μεγάλη μουσική όπως ο κλάδος ο Μουντάκης του Σκορδαλός, Um, uh, basically, he's mentioning some of the musicians such as Mundaki and Skordalos. Ναι, συνέχισαν την παράδοση που πήραν με τον Αποκόρονα. They με τα χρυσά. Continuing the traditions from Αποκόρονα Χανιά. Και δημιούργησαν πάρα πολλές συνθέσεις συρτών, συρτά, συρτά κομμάτια, συρτούς σκοπούς. They came up with very many famous old pieces of συρτά music. Και κάπως έτσι δημιουργήθηκε η μουσική παράδοση της περιοχής του Ρεθύμνου όσον αφορά τα ΣΥΤΑ. Με αυτούς τους καλλιτέχνες. I didn't quite catch all that. What? Δεν το κατάλαβα όλα. Έτσι δημιουργήθηκε η παράδοση του Ρεθύμνου στα ΣΥΤΑ με τους καλλιτέχνες αυτούς. Με τον Μουντάκη του Κλάδου του Σκορδαλό. Πριν το 1940, πριν το Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο, δεν πέσαν ΣΥΤΑ καθόλου ούτε στο Ρεθύμνο ούτε στο Ιράκλειο. Οκ, so basically what he's saying is that the ΣΥΤΑ that seeped from Kanya towards Iraqli or Rathimno started after World War II from these Apokorona Liradidas, basically. Όπως είπαμε πριν, το λαού του μπήκε από το 1920-1930 και μετά, και στα Χανιά και στο Rathimno και στο Ιράκλιο και στο Λασίθ, σε όλες τις περιοχές άρχισης σιγά σιγά να μπαίνει, από το 1930 και μετά το λαού του. Again, just touching on how λαού του made its introduction from Kanya seeping all the way towards Lasithi. Και για να μην φάω άλλο χρόνο, πηγαίνοντα το σήμερα, 
Ε, εξακολουθούν να υπάρχουν και σήμερα κατασκευαστέ οργάνων, οι οποίοι άλλοι ακολουθούν την παλιά μέθοδο και άλλοι ακολουθούν μοντέρνε μεθόδου κατασκευή. Δεν το πει όλο αυτό, Νίκο. Πε το ξανά. Είναι σήμερα υπάρχουν κατασκευαστέ οργάνων, instrument makers here in Crete, that some of them uh, trying to do like the old way of making and some of them use modern ways of making uh, instruments. Okay. Uh, the same happens to the lira and uh, to all the instruments, the traditional instruments. And uh, uh, με αυτό το τρόπο υπάρχει ένα μπέρδεμα γενικά, Μπάμπι, στον ήχο, στον ήχο. Whatever confusion because now they're trying to kind of preserve the old sound of it, but some of these people are making a modern sound of the coming from the lira, which is kind of becoming a little convoluted or mix. Αυτό που επικρατεί σήμερα, κατά τη γνώμη μου, στην Κρήτη, είναι ότι υπάρχουν πάρα πολλά πράγματα μαζί που έχουν επιρροές και από το παρελθόν και από το σύγχρονο τρόπο ζωής. Άλλη μια φορά, Νικό. Uh, my opinion is uh, that uh, today in the music and uh, dances and uh, singing, traditional singing of Crete, There are many elements of the old way of singing and playing the instruments and the dancing, and they are confused with the modern way of uh, thinking and uh, playing the instruments and singing. And uh, uh, all the environment is a confusing environment. That's what I mean, Bobby. So basically, like it, it's almost like some of these younger musicians are making it Cretan, Cretan pop or turbo Cretan, which is not a pure way of how it's supposed to be played or done. Και αυτό ε, νομίζω ότι θα έχετε διαπιστώσει και όλοι εσείς που ασχολείστε με αυτό, με το αντικείμενο αυτό. Basic, uh, άλλη μια φορά, Νίκο. Νομίζω ότι όλοι, όλοι που συμμετέχουν σήμερα στο, στην παρέα αυτή και που ασχολούνται με την παραδοσιακή μουσική και τους χορούς, νομίζω θα έχουν διαπιστώσει, θα έχουν βγάλει το συμπέρασμα, θα έχουν καταλάβει ότι υπάρχει ένα, ένα confusion σήμερα. Και στην Κρήτη και σε όλη την Ελλάδα σχετικά με τη μουσική και το χορό. Αυτό εννοώ, Παύλη. Right. What we're trying to do is just basically preserve the more traditional ways how it was supposed to be done and not this modern way of how it's been seeping through Crete. Δηλαδή, το συμπέρασμα μου είναι ότι μπορεί να δεις ένα καλλιτέχνη ο οποίος να παίζει παλιά κομμάτια, αλλά χρησιμοποιεί σύγχρονες μεθόδους, χρησιμοποιεί drums, κιθάρα ηλεκτρική, αρμόνιο, σύγχρονους ρυθμούς, οι οποίοι δεν ταιριάζουν με αυτό που έχει πάρει από παλιά. Older songs and um, the way the dances were played, they're taking older sounds and adding modern instruments which is, is causing a confusion and it's not a pure way of how the music was supposed to be done. Το ίδιο νομίζω συμβαίνει και στο χορό και στη μουσική και στο τραγούδι. The same basically with the dancing especially from what I've seen how they do sitha towards kisa more it's a little bit over the top and turbo folky. Ε, άρα στο καθ, ε, ο καθένας μπορεί να διαλέξει ότι θέλει αυτή είναι η άποψή μου ότι του αρέσει καλύτερα και αν θέλει να ψάξει να βρει ποιο είναι το αυθεντικό και το ονείρις να μπορεί μέσα από το ίντερνετ, μέσα από πηγές. It's από εκεί και πέρα επιλέγεις ότι θες εσύ να κάνεις. It's basically us, our responsibility as you know, dancers, directors to kind of search out the pure way of presenting it and not convoluted with some of the modern ways that's been um, tarnishing some of the sounds and dances of Crete. Δηλαδή για να τελειώσω μπορεί σήμερα να ακολουθήσει το παλιό τρόπο χορού, το παλιό τρόπο παίξιματο των οργάνων, τον παλιό τρόπο τραγουδιού, τον παλιό τρόπο κατασκευή φορεσιά, στολέ, ενδύματα, ή μπορεί, αν θε, να ακολουθήσει το καινούριο, είναι δικαίωμα του καθενό να κάνει ό,τι θέλει. It's your decision whether you want to pursue the original traditional way the παράδοση was done in Crete, or if you want to steer towards the kind of modern, folky, over the top. Um, turbo folk way of that's been presented over the years with Cretan music and dancing. Αυτό συμβαίνει, αυτά συμβαίνουν σήμερα. Ε, δεν θέλω να πω κάτι άλλο, Μπάμπη. Okay, Nico's done. <laughs> ναι, ναι. Πολύ σύντομα, έτσι και πολύ... Είναι πάρα πολλά πράγματα που δεν μπορούμε να τα... Ούτε σε ένα βίντεο πολύ γρήγορα να τα δούμε, ούτε να τα πούμε. Ε, μόνο να οργανώσουμε καλύτερα πώς να το πω, την επικοινωνία μας και την ανταλλαγή πληροφοριών μας. Πώς μπορούμε εμείς που συμμετέχουμε μεταξύ μας να ανταλλάζουμε πληροφορίες και να βοηθάει ο ένας τον άλλο στο να βρει πράγματα. 
basically getting together as we are right now to kind of exchanging information, doing this more often and kind of preserving the way, the proper way this should be done. Αυτό δηλαδή που δοκίμασα εγώ με σένα και το λέω σε όλο το ακροατήριο, σε όλους τους participants today, που ανταλλάξαμε πολλές πληροφορίες για να κάνουμε κάτι και να παρουσιάσουμε μια συγκεκριμένη εποχή στο πρόγραμμα που κάναμε στο HDF. Ως example, ok? So basically, like for example, the, the show that he collaborated with us, you know, was kind of like we picked a time period and presented it how it was done at that time period. Very, very raw, very, you know, not over the top like what you would see with other Cretan dancing today. Και πρέπει να είμαστε προσεκτικοί πάρα πολύ σε αυτό που παρουσιάζουμε κάθε φορά σε σχέση με ποια εποχή θέλουμε να αποδώσουμε, ποια όργανα. What time period you want to present from Cretan dancing because the time periods are all different as well and basically keeping it authentic in the way it was as pure as it can be. Αυτά. Δεν θέλω να πω κάτι άλλο προς το παρόν. I hope επιφυλάσσομαι άλλη φορά να πούμε περισσότερα ή να δείξουμε περισσότερα πράγματα. Πιο πολύ ήθελα να μιλήσω και να σας γνωρίσω σήμερα και να πω έτσι κάποια πράγματα που έχω ζήσει εγώ τόσα χρόνια που ασχολούμαι με τη μουσική παράδοση βιωματικά γιατί δεν είναι το επάγγελμά μου. Πιο πολύ διασκεδάζομαι αυτό. No, ευχαριστώ, Νίκο. Thank you very much. Εγώ ευχαριστώ, Μπάμπη, για τη βοήθεια. Να σε καλά. Νίκο, Μπάμπη, σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Ήταν μεγάλη τιμή να σας έχουμε μαζί μας. And we hope that you'll come back, Νίκο, to HDF Open Invitation. Uh, we see. <laughs> <laughs> we are healthy and strong. Of <laughs> course, Stacey, why not? Namaste, Kala. So, um, thank you again. And um, I'm, I ho I'm holding the questions that I received. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna, I'm gonna transition to to, to Sarado right now, and then in the Q and A, we'll come back to as much as we of course, can. Of course. Um, so, um, I'm moving on. Then we're gonna travel north. We're gonna go to Thraki um, with Sarado Skateronis, who is a well-known face in our HDF world. Um, I think we would call him a triple threat in, in Greek dance terms. He sings, he dances, he plays all kinds of instruments. Um, and I can tell you, because I was around to see it, that from a very young age, Sarado, um, he lived his passions without apology, fully, um, which is a beautiful thing. And it's no surprise that he's chosen to devote so much of his life to researching and preserving an area that's really close to his heart, um, and that's Traiki. He has done a, a ton, as many, many of our presenters have, um, to tie our HDF family to some of the best musicians and, and research from that area. And um, he's just given so much to our programs over time. Um, and so we're just thrilled to have him with us. And I know he's got a great presentation for us. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sadama. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks, uh, Bobby and Nico. You did a great job as well. Uh, let me just um, switch this over to my PowerPoint. All right, now tell me if y'all can see my screen because I don't know how to work these things. Yes. Perfect. Okay, you guys can see it? Good, all right, Stacy, we're good. Thank you, okay, awesome. All right, so um, so we're doing the complete opposite. We're going from Southern Greece all the way to Northeastern. So from what Bobby and Nico did uh, to Thraki. So Thraki is a very big um, presence in the HDF programs and you know a lot of the dance groups here. So. Uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy this. So briefly to talk about the geography, just so you guys have an idea where Thraki is, it's the little yellow part on that screen. Um, and you can separate it into kind of three areas as far as there's Western Thrace, Northern Thrace, and Eastern Thrace. We don't really have a say as far as what's a Southern Thrace. So it's always, that's how we kind of click characterize it. So a Western Thrace would be what's considered modern day Greece. Uh, Northern Thrace would be modern day Bulgaria. And then Eastern Thrace is the European part of Turkey. So um, kind of it, it's bordered by the Balkan Mountains to the north, the Aegean Sea to the south, and the Black Sea to the east, okay? So that's the geography of it. Just talk about like kind of Greece uh, as part of Thraki. Three, uh, Thraki within Greece um, is three provinces. So you have Xanthi, Rothopi, and Evros. So, um, I, most of you, your dance groups probably focus on dances from Evros and not as far as Xanthi or Rodopi because Xanthi and Rodopi have a huge uh, Muslim influence. So there's not a lot of Dopi villages there. So that's why you don't see a lot of the dances from them. There's a lot of them refugees from Northern Thraki, Eastern Thraki. So that's kind of why you probably don't see those kind of areas done so much. Um, whereas Evros for, for its part, it's got a lot of Dopi villages, but also has um, refugee villages. There's northern people from northern Thraki, 
um, the Gagabuzi, the Zarvanite. So there's a good mix of stuff there. So Dopi and refugees in Evros. Okay, um, and I'm gonna talk about, so I'm just gonna do about instrumentation and then I'm kind of talking about the evolution, kind of like what Bobby and Nico did, how the evolution has kind of changed how it sounded and now how it sounds and how it's got, has gone through different phases. So, um, so first the instruments, so you just have an idea. So we have, I broke into kind of four sections, lead instruments and then what can be a lead and a supporting instrument, a supporting instrument and percussion. So you can kind of see those. So you have um, lead instruments were Guy the Clarinet and Zurna. And Zurna you'd see mostly in the Bay of Thimu in some villages. Like you don't really see that in like kind of everyday things. So it's more in like the Bay of Thimu, which is done during Apocrius. And then a lead and supporting instrument. So these can be both depending on the setting. Um, you have Lira and Accordion, Kavala, which is Kavali. Kavali is more Bulgarian name, Kavala is the Greek name. Uh, Flogera. And then what are solely supporting instruments? Uh, I would say it's violi, uti, laoto, and kanonaki. Those don't really play melodies by themselves. And those are more newer instruments to the area. And then you also have a percussion. So those are the three percussions. You have dauli, duberleki, and eteneke, which is mostly found in the areas of uh, Bana. So uh, that's kind of your breakdown of instrumentation. So I'm going to highlight three instruments, okay, just because we don't have that much time, but I want to highlight kind of the three traditional instruments. I'm not going to go through the newer ones, clarinet. We kind of know those instruments. So I'm going to highlight Gaida, Lira, and Dauli. Uh, so Gaida, that's the main instrument of Thraki. Um, it's, it's what Thraki is known for, right? When you think of Thraki, you think of Gaida. So um, kind of break it down. So the design, it's got a bag, which is what you can see here. I'll kind of, if you can see my mouse, hopefully too. The bag um, is made of sheep skin or goat skin. And the bag is basically flipped inside out. So on the inside is actually hairs um, of the animal. So that's kind of how that, that's made. And there's a few people that make bags. It's kind of a dying art, but it's, it's slowly picking up with a few people. But it's still hard to find bags. You would find them mostly during Pascha because, you know, that's when they slaughter a lot of the animals or Christmas time and stuff like that or, or Panagia. So uh, that's how the bag is made. Uh, it's got a, it's a very tedious process. Um, then there's the Gaidanitsa, which is this little part right here, which is where the melody comes out and inside of that has a reed and there's seven holes on the front and one on the back. That's where you're playing your melody. Then the Buri, which is right there, it plays the drone. So if you're playing in La or A, the drone would hold one note of La. And the Gaidanitsa, the melody part, would also be that same kind of bass note, okay? And then um, there's the Fisari, which you blow into as well. Now the the gaidanitsas and, and the buri are made from wood. It depends typically amygdala, which is almond tree or karidya. So it just, it just depends on, on the maker. And uh, as more woods, exotic woods that we find, you know, like Brazilian snake wood or whatever, they start making instruments like that out of those two, which have really interesting sounds. Briefly how they play it. Um, it's pretty simple. I mean, you blow into the bag, it, the bag kind of holds your air for you. So you don't have to keep blowing into the instrument because you basically get out of breath. So that's kind of an advantage to on a guy that's compared to a clarinet or a caval or something, all the air you kind of blow into it and it holds it for you. So that's good. And then that little guy that needs a part has, has the read and that's where you play the melody. So that's kind of where your, um, your whole sound comes from pretty much. Okay. So that's that. All right, so I'm going to focus on the guy that just kind of talk about where it's played. So it's played in all areas of Thraki. Um, and um, like I said, it's what Thraki is known for. Okay, so it's kind of like if you take the guy that of Thraki, I would say it's like taking out the gladionite of mainland Greece. So it's, that's kind of how you view it. Um, the playing styles do, um, do vary a little bit. So uh, it's kind of hard to explain. You just have to kind of listen to it. Um, but You've got different styles if you go to Evros and find players, or if you go to Northern Thraki, or if you go to kind of the Rodopi area, which are like uh, the Pomaike, they're, that's, that's, they're just, they're different type of people that take too, to talk, too much time to talk about, but the Pomaike or the Eastern Thrakiotis, which is uh, Kosti and those kind of areas. And then there's, a, there's an evolution of the sound. So basically where you're finding it. So in, this, this instrument is associated with agriculture, just like Bobby and Nico said, Ascomandura. it's very agriculture areas, right? So that's what they played. When you get more to like Eastern Thrace and you get to the Poli, like Cosa di Nupoli, you don't really find it as much because there's not that agricultural kind of sense of it. So um, as far as playing styles though go, um, Evros, if you'll notice, has got more uh, playing at the top register of the guy though, whereas Northern Thraki, they play more in the bottom register. And I'll show you that in a video in a second. Um, and let's see, so 
the biggest thing with styling, what changes a lot is kind of like the yirismata. So like when you're playing cestos or you're playing kuluriastos, kuluriastos would be evros, cestos would be um, uh, northern thrace, you would have different, some similar yirismata, but also different yirismata, which as far as it's characteristic to that area. Okay, so that's, that's very important as far as how the styling comes about. Um, and how the evolution of it kind of played out over the generations. Um, it's, you have the old style, which is like, it's more raw and dirtier per se, I would say. Uh, but also has a fact that those musicians were very talented, but they also didn't have great instruments. So they were a little bit untuned. Uh, they didn't have makers now where you can produce 50 guides within a week and very good, gu you know, perfect quality. So that also plays to how those guides used to sound in the, in the past. Um, and then you kind of have like it evolved from that raw, dirty, then you have better instruments and you have more, a little bit cleaner style. Um, musicians are a little bit technic, a little better technically and uh, their technical abilities as per se. So that's how that evol evolved. And then, and you'll see, and you'll see I have uh, videos of how, uh, what my stages of evolution of the guy that are. But um, then I wanna also talk about the tuning as well. So la means uh, is usually played for evros, which is good for men's pitches. And a lot of dance groups, I always ask, you know, if I ever work with you guys, I always ask what pitch you're gonna sing in because it's very important, right? Um, so la is evros um, and um, C is the kind of the next pitch. So la has been the go-to pitch for evros, okay? In the past though, I would say 50 years ago, if not longer, then you would have a pitch called C, which is um, a one above la, okay? So it's kind of technically la is A, C is B. Okay. Back in the day, they say that it was a little bit better for men to sing at that higher pitch. You get more vocalization on the C pitch. And you see that actually in island areas. So like Gaidinos, uh, if you listen to like Manoli Huli, they, they play in a C Gaida because it's better for their vocalization. So it makes sense for this area also to have that same pitch back in the day, but it's changed now to La. It's a little bit more comfortable. Like I can't sing in C, but I can sing in La per se. But back in the day, they, they, that's what they use. And that's what they say. Um, now, when you go to Northern Thraki, you hear mostly re, re gadanitsa, which is a little higher pitched, better for women's voices. Um, but if a man is singing, you can play from re gadanitsa from la. So like I said, la is better for men. And they could actually play with re gadanitsa, play it in la. So it kind of works if a man is singing. So it, it works both ways on that one. That's kind of the tuning of the of the pitch, okay? Of the, okay, let me just play you some sound clips. So um, I'm going to play two. I'm going to play one, like an Evitico style guy, so you can hear it. This is just small clips. And then Northern Thrace, which would be like your Anatoly Kiromilia. So you'll see on the first video, um, him playing on the top register. And on the second video, they're playing more on the bottom register, okay? All right, hold on. I got to figure out how to do this. Do you... Can y'all see my screen, Stacy? Can you see my video screen or no? Okay, give me a second. Hold on. Second. All right, that was so that was the pit that was kind of the vertical style. So you saw him more playing on that top part. So now let me to show you Northern Thray. So you'll see his fingers are kind of playing on the bottom part.
Okay, so that was the two different kind of, I don't know if you could tell the difference, but you have the one top where they're playing up top and then the bottom playing and playing from the bottom register. So again, that's kind of how um, the different styling as far as um, uh, how the guy that's played in different areas. So the second instrument, or we're going to just briefly touch on is uh, the lira. Okay, so the Thrakiotiki lira, I would say is kind of the lost instrument, but that's now kind of in a revival stage. So um it's it's picking up a little bit again so the design briefly so you have kind of the base of the uh instrument and then um it's made out of wood again usually an almond tree or caridia and then you also have um three strings okay and they're usually made out of pig intestines so they'll dry them up um they kind of have the best sound and then you also have uh the bow which is like a regular bow but the the I guess the the hair part is the is from a uh, horse hair horse tail hair, okay. So that's how kind of um, it's made up of, and that can change briefly based on who's making the lead up. How it's played, pretty simply, how you see the lead is played from Bobby and Nico's presentation, uh, same kind of way, a little bit less finger movement than the Cretan lead up, um, but it's it's generally played the same way and it's actually tuned the same way as well as the Cretan lead up. All right, so um, where it's played. So this differs a little bit because it's not as well known as the guida per se. Um, so it's typically found as a lead instrument in uh, the northeastern Thrace villages. So as a lead instrument in villages like Kosti and Samakova, which are really done in, in, by uh, dance groups. So you might not be too familiar with them. It's uh, the only area of Thraki where it's actually the lead instrument, okay? Now in Evros, it's also found in various villages, but it's hard to pinpoint which villages had uh, Lida. Like, so if you go to like Azvestadas per se, you really wouldn't see Lida there, but you could see it in Northern, uh, Northern Evros, so like the Trigonos areas. So um, like one thing that somebody from that area told me is that they, their last name was Lirudis. So if you have a last name of Lirudis, then it makes sense for that, someone to be a Liradzi back then, right? Because last names were based off um, what they did. So it is found, the issue is that there wasn't really a lot of Evritiki Lira players that are on recording and stuff. So you don't really know how they used to play that instrument. So we've kind of adapted it to how they play it in the Northeastern Thrace villages of Kosti and they've tuned it to that. So we can't really say that the Lira has evolved in that kind of sense because we've just kind of taken it from the Kosti area. So the Costis, and then there's also Eastern Thrace, the Politiki Lira, which again, not many people play. Um, and it's got a very distinct sound, which I'll show you in, in, a, in another video, in a video in a second. Uh, the playing styles, they differ if you go from Costi to Eastern Thrace to Evros. And again, I've touched on the evolution. Uh, the Costis got that very raw, aggressive kind of sound, which also helps with the Dauli, which you'll hear in a second as well. Um, and whereas the Evritiko is a little bit, uh, a little bit cleaner, I would say. It's not as raw. And that's kind of like the guy who's playing in this picture, he kind of plays in that style. Whereas um, you'll see in a video in a second where the Costi is a little bit more, again, raw and uh, more impactful. And that has to do with the case that it's also the lead instrument in that area. So it's gotta be more, it's gotta have more of a presence. Whereas the Evritiki Lira doesn't have to have as much of a presence because it's got the Gaida with it, okay? Um, as far as uh, the pitching, the tune, the La Re Sol is the, is the, is the is the standard uh, tuning of the Thrakiotikila, which is similar to Kriti as well. So um, that again is from Kosti. Evritikilira, they all say back in the day when there was an Evritikilira that it could have been tuned la la mi. Okay, but nobody tunes it like that. The la la mi tuning is where you'll find in drama. So that's kind of, you hear that sound. They say that could have been the Evritikilira sound as well, but we're not sure because that instrument kind of died off for a while. And we and it came back based on how they played in Kosti. So in Evros, we were not sure how it really was kind of played. So let me just give you three sound clips. Give you an Evritiki kind of sound, Kosti sound, and a Politiki lira. Okay. So you have an idea. Let's see here. Let me share. All right. So Evritiki lira here. Okay. More sweeter sound. Okay.
Okay, and then uh, let me show you like a little bit more costi. It's a little bit more, like, a little bit more impactful. And you'll hear that more on the on the W video too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have a video for that as well. So this is costi. Okay, that's Costi, and then Politiki Lira, which has got its own distinct sound. And this is really not very, people don't, I think Sinopolis is, is the main guy that plays this instrument. Very, not many people play it, unfortunately, but it's got a beautiful sound. Okay, political leader. Okay, so that's that. All right. Okay, so the last instrument I'm going to touch on is the dauli. Okay, um, and so the dauli is the main percussion instrument of the area. Um, its design is got got the base made out of wood, um, and then the two sides have a. Uh, it's, it's dried up kind of skin. Now, it depends on where you go now. Some areas you might find plastic and it depends on who you like, what sound you like and what sound you're going for is what you're gonna pick as far as that instrument. Um, and then you have the copano, which is kind of that bigger stick, which plays on the, the downbeat, the kind of all the heavy beats so you can hear it. And then, then you have the vitsa, which is a little smaller stick played on the other side that gives you kind of all the filler, the, a lot of that filling in uh, sound. So uh, that's kind of how, that's the kind of the general, Thing of the Dawi. Now, where it's played, again, it's played in most of the areas of Greece, um, uh, I mean, most areas of Fragi, and uh, it's a little bit less from the eastern Thrace, like when you go to Costa Dinupoli, again, the more city areas, per se, you're not going to see those kind of instruments, because they're more Sobani instruments, per se. Um, now, I've heard that they don't play Dawi in Asvestadis. I find it hard to believe that, like, you have double in all areas of that of that um, of Evros and around those villages, but Asbestos didn't somehow didn't have double. So um, I've heard that from a few people, but I have find a hard time believing it. So, like I said, when you do Asbestos, you usually use a Duberleki, but I don't see why double would not be correct in this area. Um, as far as styling, it does change a little bit um, as in the different areas. Um, when you go to Northern Thraki, you have a little bit more on the heavy side on the on the Copano side. Evros also has it, but not as much. You got a little bit more filler on the Evros side. Um, and then the Costi kind of drumming is a whole distinction of, of sound. So that's, um, that's, you have to hear it to, to really understand what I mean. So I'm gonna play that on the next video. So also listen for the lead I hear change um, as far as uh, how it sounds a little bit different. So, and the Daoli. So this is the Costelidico Daoli. I'm not gonna play Evros or Northern Thraki because we kind of uh, hear that at, you know, on a, at these events all the time. Hold on, let me share my screen. New share. Okay, so that's kind of your your sound there. Okay, on that it's again very distinct for that area. Okay, and you and you don't find that in, on the other areas of Thraki. So uh, so that's that. So again, the instrumentation that's kind of the list, and kind of just want to briefly uh, the last kind of parts to talk about the songs and the kind of the evolution. So the old and the new. So anything you see kind of highlighted is what it was replaced by. So you see that. Um, the old is on the left side and the new is on the right side. So the clarinet replaced essentially guidance or not. 
and then the violin replaced the lira. Uh, the caval and floyera were supporting instruments, were kind of, you could say, replaced by uti, laut, or kanonaki. And then duberlaiki replaces the other daoli and, and kanateneke. Um, why the evolution? Um, it's got that feeling of these instruments to the left were looked more looked down upon. So um, they're the tsopani instruments, whereas the to the right, the newer, the more higher class instruments. So that's kind of why those were deserted for many years. Um, people had to hide in the days to play these instruments or they would get beaten if they were found playing these instruments. So that's why we had that kind of big gap in like between like the seventies and, and the two thousands kind of, a, of, of these kind of players. Um, I have the accordion in the middle just because it can be considered an old and a little bit of a new depending on who you're talking to, but, um, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of why it's placed there. Uh, and then I want to briefly talk about the instrumentation by the region. So you have Western Thais, you see what's the lead instruments, Gaida, and then uh, substituted by the clarinet in the future. Um, supporting instruments, you see those there, and then the percussion. So I kind of listed those out for the PowerPoint for you guys so you can have them kind of as to what, if you're deciding on doing a set, kind of what instruments you're looking for, and you have kind of a list of that stuff, okay? Um, same thing here, did the same thing. Um, in, in Northern Thrace, you don't really see too much of a change, and I'll touch on that on a second. You kind of still have the traditional instruments dominating that area, which is good. You don't really see a clarinet influence in, in this area. All right, and then uh, evolution of the band. So back in the time, you would see um, in Evros, you could see the, the bands or the ziya would be just a guy that's playing, or maybe two guys that's playing, or maybe a guy that's a daouli together but you really wouldn't see a whole mix as to what you see now on the right. So you would now have maybe have a, have a glendi with a gaida with a lira or caval or together and a daoli or have a gaida and an accordion with a daoli. Back in the day, it was just maybe a gaida, maybe a cavala, maybe a gaida and a daoli. So that's kind of how that's changed. And the reason is why it's changed is kind of, um, it's got a better sound to the ear when you're hearing just a gaida. Would you rather just have a performance per se with just a gaida, or would you rather have it with a gaida and a caval and a doli? It brings adds that more kind of flair, and it's better sounding to the ears. Okay, so kind of just to see how that evolution is, I have the evolution in four sections. Okay, the old, which is just a gaida and maybe a, a percussion, the new, which is the clarinet and all that stuff, the traditional new, which would be more of um, adding the guide and the lead and the daoli and then the new new which is kind of what Bobby was touching on as well and Nico as it becomes more modern with traditional instruments so I'm just going to play a brief segment on each one of these okay so the old So that's the old sounding. This is kind of what was replaced by the clarinets in like I would say the 60s, 70s, whatever. Okay, and then the new traditional, which is all the older instruments together. And then what I call the new new, which is taking the traditional and just making it so modern that it's, I don't like it, but this is how it would be. Okay, so that's kind of the evolution. So if you can hear it, so more, more, um, just too fast, and I don't know. I personally don't like it. Uh, some people do, but I don't like it personally. Um, that last slip. Okay, same thing. You're seeing that kind of same thing in the in the northern Thrace stuff. I'm not gonna play uh, if sound clips for this because we're a little bit short on time. But that's kind of that same concept in northern Thrace. Okay. Um, as far as the future, it's good. As far as uh, traditional instruments everything's picking up you're getting more guy players more lead up players 
uh, more double E players. Um, but you are losing a little bit like the clarinet. So you don't have these old, because cl clarinet's a big part of Evros too, right? Um, even though it came in later, it's still a huge part. So you're losing a lot of that old clarinet evritico style, which that isn't kind of uh, being kind of embraced by the younger generation. They're more on the Gaida. It, it has that, it has a way, like Gaida was bad uh, for whatever. Then it went to clarinet was, you know, the thing to learn. Then it comes back down to Gaida and clarinet was forgotten. So that's kind of what you're seeing as far as the future. But generally the future is good. You have people that make instruments so you have access to them and you have people that are teaching um, the instruments. Last thing I'm gonna touch on are the songs. So briefly, just um, how the songs of Thraki came up to be. It came from daily events, wars, uh, stories. So if like a Maria loved Yanni and the there would be a song about them and it would describe the situation. So that's how songs kind of came about. Types of songs, they're, they're separated by occasion. So like apocriatica or weddings or by season, like a spring song or a summer song. Um, as far as where they were sung, um, um, as far as where they were sung, it was the women would sing in the neighborhoods and like while they're cooking or sewing. And um, whereas the men would be singing at the taverna accompanied by instruments, okay? So that's kind of where you see the difference as to where they were sung. Vocalization, styling depends on dialect. You got kind of got that choreotico, nasally sound, which a lot of groups try to mimic, which is not the best way to sound nasally. Um, and then uh, the drone is also very, a very, um, controversial topic, I would say, uh, which would be too controversy, controversial and too much to talk about right now. Uh, but it is found in Thraki, and it makes sense that all the instruments have drones, so the vocalization would also have a drone as well. I'm also going to save the sound clips due to uh, time constraints. Um, the last slide here is the song dance relationship. So most of the songs are um, Zona Radica, as you would imagine, it's the main dance of Thraki. So a lot of the songs are Zona Radica. Then I would say Epitrapezia are next. And Epitrapezia are those songs that are sung at, at the Catistica or at the Trapezi, where they're more melancholic. So they've got more sadness to it, uh, wars and stuff like that. That's what those songs are made of. Whereas the dancing songs had a little bit more beat to it. Um, then you also have uh, the last part of kind of Thrakiotica dancing and how the song relates to it is the parts. So you know, Thrakiotika's got part one, part two, part three. Um, so that plays a key role as far as um, how the dance comes. So you have to listen to the song and when part one is in part two, part three would be the yid is my right when the guy there or whatever goes wah and you're, you're doing kuluria or you're dancing from sirto to a couple's dance. That plays a key role. And the intensity differs as far as if it's acapella or instrument, right? So if you have an acapella song, intensity very low, like tapinos, walking, whereas instrument song, you know, songs accompanied by instrument, there's more upbeat, a little bit more peppy. And that also um, plays a role as far as the differences in part one, two, and three. So that's kind of the whole presentation. Um, sorry, I went over a little over time, Stacey, but um, that is what I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarado. And just a virtual um, round of applause for all of our, our presenters. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, we're going to transition quickly now um, to the Q&A portion. Before we go to the, to the main panel, um, I just want to give um, each, uh, Bobby and, and Nico, each of you had a question based on your presentation. Um, Bobby quickly um, from Joanna Hawkins, she wanted to know if girls can lead the Pidicto in Asterosia, so if you could just address that quickly. Uh, yeah, Joanna, yes, from videos I have, and I can send you a video, women can lead the Pidicto, and they, they lead it with a sort of grace and refinement, like the hand down, very subtle movements, but absolutely women can lead the Pidicto in Asterosia, in La Siti. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Antikanis. Yes, thank you. thank you. Hi, fine. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your presentation. We really appreciate the. And yes, I did uh, um, notice that the uh, girls do predict. I just wanted to confirm that because I got some conflicting information. I also have one more question, or, unless you want me to wait, Stacy, for later. No, no, go, go for it. And then right after that, we'll introduce the rest of the, of the QA panel. Oh, okay, so Nico and uh, Bobby, I wanted to ask you about the Pontic influence on the Cretan dancing, especially on the East Crete and specifically on Sitia. What is the Pontic influence that you are you aware of the Pontic influence in the Cretan dancing and dances generally? Um, me in general, I, 
I, I, I'm not quite sure, Joanna, honestly. I mean, I know that the Las Yotis supposedly came from the Las people, which were from Bondos or next to Bondos. Um, in terms of that, and you know, I don't really see much similarity between Cretan and Pontian dancing. I mean, they're kind of apples to oranges. I know there's been a trend of kind of making the syn synthesis between the two and showing presentations and performances, and there have even been, been FDF performances with it. Aside from the Las Yoti, really, I mean, I, I really don't know and I may not be the best person to ask, you know, Joe Graziotti might be a little bit more versed in answering that, but I, I, I really don't see much of a correlation unless, you know, Pontians came from Bondos to Kriti after the Alosio Constantinople or something, honestly. Thank, thanks for that, Joanna. And um, before um, we move on, I just want to introduce the rest of our panel. Um, and these are um, a group of really great guys who have done a lot for our HDF program over the years. They've been around forever. They wear a lot of hats. Not only are they fantastic musicians, but a lot of them are also directors, dancers themselves, um, multi-talented and pretty fun to be around. So I would want to introduce uh, Mitzo Dallas, who's joining us from Chicago, and Yanni Temeli, who's in New York, and Dimitri Papa Dimitriou, who is in Atlanta, and then Sadat was going to join in too from here in Charlotte. So thanks guys for being on. Actually, Dimitri, if you want to unmute for a second, I know you actually had the question that was for, for Nico, it was about Lao Don Hanya. So if you want to, if you want to talk about that and say a couple words before we take some questions. Yes. Ναι, κύριε Νίκο, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την παρουσία σας και, και όλες τις πληροφορίες. Ήθελα να ρωτήσω, ε, παλιά στα Χανιά, όταν έπαιζε ένας λίρα, ήταν τυπικό να έχει μόνο ένα λαουτιέρι, πότε έγινε θέμα δύο λαούτα, τρία λαούτα και τέτοια. Λέμε για παραδοσιακά. Mm. Οι πρώτοι βιολίστες... Δεν έπαιζαν, δεν είχαν λαούτο. Το λαούτο εμφανίστηκε από το 1900 και μετά. Βιολί έχουμε από το 1700 και μετά. Άρα οι πρώτοι βιολίστε δεν είχαν λαούτο, έπαιζαν χωρί λαούτο. Και έβγαλαν πάρα πολλά κομμάτια χωρί καθόλου λαούτο. Όταν εμφανίστηκε το λαούτο αρχέ του 1900, σαν ε, όργανο ρυθμού, συνοδευτικό, έτσι συνόδευε το, το βιολί, η λίρα έπαιζε τη μελωδία, το λαούτο συνόδευε με το ρυθμό. Και είχαμε μία λίρα και ένα λαούτο ε, και είναι η ζυγιά, όπως τη Θράκη. Η ζυγιά, ζυγιά means double. Double instruments means uh, the ζυγιά uh, word. So we had the ζυγιά, violin and uh, lute, or uh, lira and lute. Τα δύο λαούτα εμφανίστηκαν μετά το δεύτερο παγκόσμιο πόλεμο, μετά το 50 δηλαδή. Έγιναν, έγιναν σχήμα. Μπορεί κάπου να έπαιζαν ένα λιράρη, ένα βιολιστή με δύο λαούτα. Αλλά σαν σχήμα, σαν σχήμα επίσημα, σαν επίσημο σχήμα, φανίστηκε μετά το δεύτερο παγκόσμιο πόλεμο. Άρχισε να μπαίνει και το δεύτερο λόγο. Παρακαλώ. Άλλη μια, Στέση, άλλη μια ερώτηση πριν που έκανα του Μπάμπη, δεν ε, ξέρω αν πρέπει να απαντήσω. Αυτό ήταν. Εγώ είμαι από τον Δημήτρη. Αυτό ήταν. Ναι, από τον Δημήτρη, οκ. Από εκεί, Δημήτρη. Αυτό ήταν και από The woman before the meeting. Uh, uh, that, was, that was just for Bobby. Yeah. Okay. 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 All good. Um, so thank thank you for that, Dimitri. Did you want to say a few words, or can I can I scoot on to some questions? You can scoot on questions. I know we're getting close on time. Okay. Well, this is where this is where everybody um, is welcome to to send along questions, raise your hand, or just jump in. But I do have a couple of pre-submitted ones that I wanted to to get out there for these guys. Um, this this portion can be very practical. Obviously, a lot of us or most of us are directors and may have some questions uh, related to our performances and the way we prepare for HDF. And um, one of, one of the I thought a great question was, when is a good time during the HDF planning process uh, as a director to send the musicians, material, music, clips, um, the specifics about performances. Um, so yeah, um, well, I guess I can take a quick precursor and just say that, you know, we have been playing music for a long time at HDF and other events and whatnot, and we have a lot of experience working with directors, new and old, uh, and it's a, an exciting thing, but I guess the best thing I could start this uh, answer to the question is communication is key. Every expectation can be met if there's good communication way ahead of time and it's frequent. Um, to answer the question specifically, um, January is when HDF usually happens. 
Uh, and the, the longer people wait, the harder it is to be able to manage. There's lots of musicians that come uh, from Greece, uh, all over the United States to accommodate all the groups. And being in the format it currently is with about two and a half days worth of time, it's really hard to get everything done and to accommodate so many groups um, on a level by which, you know, you can, for example, practices right now can only really run 30 minutes because we have so many groups using live music. But if these groups are communicating with musicians, probably around October to November is a great time to get their information to the whatever musicians they're using. Um, set the expectations, open up a dialogue. This is what we were trying to do. Will this work? Will this not work? And by that, you know, we have uh, gotten great questions over the years where, you know, I, I myself have directed them to Joe or Cristo Papacosa or other people where I don't, I'd rather get the traditional sense of what the director is trying to do uh, captured uh, before I make any assumptions. So all that can happen way ahead of time. The sooner the better really is the short answer of that. Thanks for that, Dee. Um, speaking of, a, a, it kind of leads into another question that was submitted. It was, you talked about the 30 minute before, uh, practice that is what typically you get if, you, if you're on site at HDF and you have that quick 30 minutes to, to, to really nail it down with your musicians. Um, what are some tips you guys can offer to, for people to get the most out of those 30 minutes and to make it the most impactful? Dee, um, you want to take this one or should I? Go ahead, Mito. All right. Um, the, my best suggestion is to come prepared. A lot of times what we end up doing is waiting for groups to get their choreography ready or to make sure that they need to take that extra turn or really explain to us what's going on. Realistically, you have 30 minutes, right? If you're going to use us as part of your show or us or any of you, any musician that you have for that amount of, of practice, if you're using us for that little amount of time, Okay, to put together your show, it's already lost. You know, you're spending 10, 15 minutes on uh, telling us what to do, and then you have 15 minutes to run it twice. It doesn't work. So my best suggestion is, uh, is definitely come prepared. Know where you want us uh, as musicians, whoever the musician is, um, and also communicate. If you guys want us to be in a certain spot, communicate that ahead of time. So at least we have the idea you know, an idea that we have to be in the middle or we have to be on the side, move during the song, whatever the case, uh, like Dee said, communication is key to this whole thing. And a lot of groups over the years, um, it, it's getting so great now. Uh, I mean, I, I can't complain uh, except to the fact that, you know, when, when we do go through some of these things over and over again, uh, as far as like, you know, hey guys, let's not do acapella singing right now and practice that. Let's do it outside. Let's let's work on the musical things. But everyone is, people are drawing up PowerPoints now and showing direction and that's wonderful. We really appreciate that because it gives us an idea of your vision. And it also helps us to understand, like Mitsu said, are we on stage left? Are we in the middle? Are we walking on with Maria? Are we, you know, there's lots of elements to these shows because of the tradition. And so we want to get it right just as much as the directors do. So yeah, come prepared, be ready to work and get your dancing down and, you know, we can adjust and, you know, we've gone over and again, there's lots of musicians out there. So, you know, we hate to say it's 30 minutes only. We'd love to spend as much time as we possibly could because we want to get it right just as much as everybody else. Um, that actually, you guys are just leading really one thing into the other on these questions here. So I appreciate that. Um, one of, one of the questions was regarding singing. And, um, so what are some of the pitfalls or things to pay attention to when incorporating singing by the group along with the live music? That's a tough one. Uh, look, without being insulting, a lot of groups are, for lack of a better word, tone deaf or don't understand or not musical. Uh, so what we end up doing is correcting a lot of pitch stuff that takes forever. Um, uh, best suggestion, if you guys aren't musical, don't try and incorporate musicians during that. Make it an acapella song. It's going to be more seamless for you guys. It's easier for you guys to practice. And it takes a lot less time for us to correct stuff on our end during a practice that you guys should be using for dancing. Mm -hmm. One of, one of the, uh, I guess, best practices, uh, and I brought this up when we were initially discussing, Stacey, is, 
you know, every church usually has a choir director or someone that is more musical that could help a group. So we did that in Atlanta one year. We just, I could, like Mitzel said, some of the boys just could not carry a tune. They were having difficulty. So we got our choir director to come in and show a couple of tricks and tips and how to project and how to sing and not be embarrassed or scared. Um, that was very helpful to our community. And another thing like Mitzel said is, you know, if you are planning on doing, uh, having a singer sing along, uh, if we know the exact music uh, that they're gonna use, we could learn it to that note or to, you know, whatever song that is and pitch so we can help them. Something that we've done before, I don't know, you guys say how helpful this is, is to you, but is, you know, sending audio clips of, of a group singing to you guys in advance, is that helpful? Absolutely. The more we know, the better. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And then one of the things that I, we had also brought up in conversation that sort of relates to that might be helpful for people to hear is, you know, we pro obviously we don't have the musicians with us for months and months in advance. And so you do get tied to the recorded music, the specific songs that you're listening to. Um, I know that can be an issue sometimes when they finally get to you guys. I think um, as a good practice as, as dance groups and as just Helene's is knowing that just having a tunnel vision on, okay, I'm learning this Zona Radico. It's not the only one. And as Nico and Bobby mentioned earlier and Sarando, there's so many instruments used in all the regions. So it would be um, very beneficial to groups if they would, you know, if they listen to one Zona Radico reach out to some of these directors and to musicians, Greece, everywhere, and, and try to get more pieces of music so you get a better understanding of not only the rhythms, but other melodies. There may be a song that you haven't heard yet that becomes your new favorite song. It's happened to all of us. So um, I think that's a very important thing is to you know, get a variety. So when, if we play something slower or faster, or if like Sarando was saying, we can't match this pitch in this way on this gaida, uh, and the girls have to make an accommodation or whatnot, then people are not stuck. What do we do? What do we do? Um, you know, I, and I think that's just a good rule of thumb. It's just a, and it helps, you know, Greek dance education, and it helps the dancers and directors and everyone when they work together and expand their horizons. No, absolutely. And it's, an, it's, an, it's great that we're being able to do things like this, too, to expand that network of people that are, are great resources and um, are so open to sharing. So we're, we're grateful for that. Um, I'm going to throw this next one at Yanni, because I think he'll have a lot of stuff to say about it. Um, what would invite, your advice be for students interesting in learning, interested in learning how to play a folk instrument? First, number one, to, to just reach out to us. You, we're, we're very, very accessible. We're on social media, you see us at, at the events, whether it's at, a, at Sarando's Anixi, which hopefully will, this will happen in you know, Finopero or next Anixi, HDF, FDF. Um, we're accessible. We're easily reachable. Any instrument that, you could, that, that anybody's possibly interested, regardless of the style of music that they are interested in, they can always reach out to us come to me or 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 uh, or Mito for for lauto consultation or or the miti for percussion sarando for uh, for anything related to thracian music even even Mito, all of us and and there's so many of us around even joe graciosi may have may have some uh, some input or we could direct you to him we could direct you to jim to tashi or whoever uh, there's plenty of people on this on this entire meeting here that that aren't eligible but you could always start through us if you see us if you can reach out to us it's great we're great i think we're all decent resources we could direct to the right place in, in the time that we're living in now when there's less less physical contact and we're far away from each other do you guys think it's um uh it's still impactful to do virtual lessons is that some a good option for kids absolutely oh, totally. absolutely it's yeah, it, it's happening right now with, with me, with, with other Lauto players here in New York. I'm sure with uh, Dimitri, both, both Dimitris from, from uh, SM and Sarando. Uh, I, I myself personally, Stacy, have reached out to uh, a very um, well-known percussionist in Greece so I can take some lessons on things that I've been looking into. And he's like, yep, very easy. We can do this through Zoom, Skype, Otithelis. So it, it's, it's very doable.
good to know. You can't hug your teacher, but you know, we do our best. Um, okay, I have a few more pre, uh, pre submitted questions, but I want to just take a pause and make sure that no one wants to jump in that has anything uh, related or just has a question. You're welcome to jump in, take yourself off mute or type them to me. Raise your hand, all kinds of ways. Um, and <laughs> Tashi says, Zrnaz, hard on Zoom. You're not wrong, Tashi. It's hard <laughs> anywhere, Jimmy. <laughs> Um, always with the zingers. Okay, a be best way to approach AV was a was a pre pre written question here. Um, what questions should directors be asking in advance? What what's important about AV that again helps that process become a little smoother when it comes down to performance time? Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, you guys as a committee do a fantastic job. It's getting better and better every year. The AV is just getting better and better. I know there are blips sometimes with the team, depending on the city and location, but um, one really good thing to do, and I know you can list it out on the HDF um, portal, what you're going to be using, but I will use Bobby as a great example. Bobby has reached out to me on several occasions being like, hey, I got Petro from Greece is going to be our, our you know, lead up player. He's requesting this. Is this accessible? Is this available? Or he will tell me, this is what this musician needs or requires. Um, we, and then we can go back uh, as musicians who have experience with this equipment, playing live and whatnot. We can go to the actual HDF committee. Or um, I've spoken personally to the sound techs on hand uh, many times to help relay the information. And some of these guys, they've seen this like at FDF. They've seen a guy that a million times by the end of the week and they're like, yeah, 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 we know we need to put the mic there. We get it. But sometimes when you have new people, it takes a little bit of like, you know, explaining to them up front and getting them information. So when we get to the show time, it's quick and seamless. Um, another one that we get a lot is, okay, I have three girls that want to sing. How should we do this? Um, if we knew that ahead of time, we could tell you that don't put all three girls next to each other with a you know, wireless mic because you might get feedback and then it'll turn into Halya. So, um, you know, again, the more we know up front, don't be afraid to ask. We can always definitely help and try to point you in the right direction or get the answers from you guys as the committee or uh, the AV team. No, that, that's super helpful. And one thing that we talked about, I'll just take a beat just to talk about this too, that um, we were talking about this the other night as we prepared for this event. And um, it's an idea that's, you know, hopefully in development with this series is to offer a space for resources um, and checklists and things that you guys can refer to, like a reference section um, that would include obviously the presentations from these events, but also tips. Um, so uh, we talked about actually putting together a checklist for directors um, to, to sort of go by and make sure you're, you're hitting all the marks and remembering things because there's so many details uh, during that HDF planning process. And so uh, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have some things like that to give you guys. Um, this was a, a question or a, a comment and a topic of discussion that Eleni Hopes actually thought was really important. Um, and it's her question was regarding the fact that many of us, uh, most of us probably teach students who have very or little, very little or no knowledge of the Greek language and how do you pr best prepare those dancers for singing um, in Greek when they may not have that experience for that. Parado, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can take it. Um, it's hard. Like if you don't, that is a hard question because there's not really an easy, it's like a, there's not like a thing you can say that's just a solution that'll kind of solve it. When you don't have the dialect, they don't have the um, the accent for it. It's really hard. The one thing that I'll tell you, because when I directed and we did like Gagauzika, which is essentially in a Turkish language, which we none of us speak Turkish, honestly, right? So like what, what we had and what our lead singers did and our dance group did, and I thought they did a good job of it was keep listening to the sound. So you just play it and you're just listening to that all, all, all the time. You know, if you're, you know, going on a run or you're driving, if you keep listening to that, um, that dialect, it'll eventually, not it'll come natural, but it'll be better than if you, you know, if you didn't do that. So I think that's a really big key thing. So if you're a director, I would give that music to your, to your dancers and what they're going to sing and just have them keep listening to it and keep listening to it. I mean, there really isn't much. I mean, what you really uh, can't do in that scenario. I don't know if everybody else, the way other directors here. I, can, I have another thing that, you know, to pile onto that side onto is one thing that I've done for many years uh, to battle the language barrier is to, 
get a good set of lyrics and I can lean on uh, uh, Cristo Papa Costa. I've gone to him many times for lyrics and he's given me Cristo para Policristara uh, for all the help. Uh, but I take that and I speak Greek. So if you don't speak Greek, you can go to the Greek school teacher at your church and have them get you phonetics. Uh, you know, I, you know, it looks strange on paper to people that read Greek, they're like, oh, but it, it, you know, they can see the E, the U, the A, they can learn the pronunciation in English phonetics. And that's helped a lot of the groups that I've worked with in the past. So that, that's another little, that might be, besides just listening and, and learning and understanding the words in Greek is phonetics. And how, and how much emphasis do you guys, uh, in, in your opinion, and this can go to, I mean, you guys are directors as well, and you've had experience with this. How much emphasis would you put on trying to not only get them to sing in Greek, but also take it a step further, like you said, into certain dialects or with the, that sound, the sarado that you talked about during your presentation that may have that name. I mean, are you supposed to, do you think it's important to go that route or, or not? A hundred percent. Because if you're doing, let's say, Gagauzika, and it doesn't sound like Gagauzika, then are you really doing it? You know what I'm saying? So, like, I'm very critical of that. That's just, that's how I am. But I think it's very important to hit that, the, the dialect. I mean, it is. And the phonetics actually is, is a very good way to do it. Um, it's very, the dialect's important, but you also don't want to force it. Like, so you don't want to sound really nasally either. You know, you want to give, you want to make that styling correct, but you also don't want to force it. A lot of people try to do, like, um, they try to do that really like really horio kind of dialect i would say so like kim like kimase they would instead of kimase they would be kimasi like that sounds really forced and it doesn't it doesn't come out good because you don't naturally have that kind of um uh, that dialect per se you just have you can't the key thing is not forcing it but also doing it in a good way <laughs> it's it's a hard it's very hard to do it's it's a layer and a lot easier said than done no, absolutely. And I'm going to tell you guys again, have a, have a look at these comments when you get the transcript, because there's funny stuff in there, but there's also a lot of for actually good information. So definitely have a look at those. Um, we've got a lot of really knowledgeable people. Yeah, just on yeah, I've always said a good thing. Dictate practices, just, oh yeah. Uh, when I directed, I would always have seen practices. Yeah. But I was also don't like what Eleni, the question I, you said came from Eleni. I never had that problem because I always thought like an, a higher, an adult group per se, and they were older and they all spoke Greek. So I can't put myself in any of shoes as far as, that's very challenging. So I, I commence groups that can do that because I don't think I could be able to do that. I forgot what group it was where the girl didn't even speak Greek at all, like in, in a, a dialogue sense. And she sounded like she spoke Greek for years because she learned the song Apexa. I mean, it was beautiful. I, I, I can't remember what community that was, but we were all like, you don't speak Greek at all. You sound fantastic. So I think, yes, Bobby, repetition, practice, and just listening over and over again and using what you got. Making it so the kids sing it all the time. Like they, they can't get it out of their heads. That's what happens. That's a good thing. Um, I have a question here from Michael Chambers. He says, what level of improvisation goes into creating a set? Do you select instruments based on the dances proposed and play specific songs or can you implement any instrument to the song you wish to play? It has a lot to do with where you're dancing from, right? So any of you can take that. Me too. Uh, that's uh, a multi <laughs> part. Of, let's break that question down. So yeah, so say the first the part again because I forgot it by the time we got well, to the I, end. I think the essence of the question is, is there an element of improvisation uh, in terms of um, you know, do you have latitude, I mean, with, with what instrumentation you choose for, for the dances? And Michael, you can oh, okay. if I'm wrong about interpreting that, but I think that's what you're saying. Okay. Uh, as far as instrumentation, so from our, as, from our point, or our point of view, we try and keep it as, as traditional as possible. So if somebody wants a gaida, let's say, during a carpenicioso set, I'm not going to do it. And neither is Sarado, right? Okay. Um, but we'll, no, <laughs> there's no room for improvisation. <laughs> I, can, I can kind of clarify. Is it working? Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we hear you. Oh, okay, so, um, so I know y'all have played together for a long time, but if you were to 
not know the same specific song and you wanted to play that like a dance that would be that song is there a way that you can improvise to play together or is is there is that kind of breaking is that kind of a glitch in the matrix do you have to just know the same songs that go together with the instruments or can you kind of just play with it does that make sense i think in the context of a traditional uh a set, let's say, you're going to do Zona Radica. There are a thousand Zona Radica actual melodies, tunes with slight variances, but there's a lot of them. There's tons. Right. But if you're talking about like in the middle of something that we're working towards in a, in a traditional set and then to add something else into it that might be more modern, is that what you're, you're saying? And we just kind of go on the fly with it? No, like you said, there's thousands of melodies for for every individual instrument like you're not going to hear two, you well you may but you're not going to hear two of the same songs on the gaida even though they go for the same dance right so even though the melody is different it's still the same dance and it could be from the same region so if right. you, if you just don't know the same if, if you just don't know the parts for the instruments that are supposed to play together i guess can you can you kind of just throw anything in or is that like i said like a glitch in the matrix do you have to like adhere to the specific songs well at hdf you know the the idea is to preserve the tradition and the culture so i wouldn't say to just throw in whatever because then yeah the glitch in the matrix but a good example of what you're talking about is if you look at videos from monastiri or neo monastiri on uh, new year's day when they play the everyone thinks that testos is uh, two songs in talking to the guys from there and through Dean of Dallas, you know, they have so many zona songs and the melody changes. It's the same instruments, but then halfway through the set, uh, if you watch last year's video, this guy shows up with a, a accordion, he starts playing. Then when he's taking a break, another guy comes in with a, the flogera. And so they mix up not only just Gaida and the drum, they, and then there's different singers. So they're kind of improvising within the confines of the monastiri, the zona radico, what's what you're seeing. But for them to throw in an electric guitar, I, well, yeah, through, yeah. you know what I mean? Or something. It, it Obviously within the confines of the yeah. of, of tradition, but, but. Right. I think it's. So I here's think, the thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Age before beauty. Right. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing we're never going to do it during a, an hdf set let's say if we're, we have specific tunes that we need to do for the groups right this is something that you would see at the Gledi, okay where sarado will play 19 songs that none of us have ever, uh, we've never heard them because you know i don't really believe they exist until sarado <laughs> starts playing um but we know enough about our instruments to be able to follow along and a lot of times that's how it was traditionally too. okay i guess that's kind of uh, what i was asking yeah right yeah you know so i hope that kind of answers so it. kind of but not really <laughs> <laughs> call me after this so we don't keep everybody out of <laughs> important too like i don't know if this answers the question uh either but like i think it's important to whatever region you're doing you have to pick the right instruments for what you're presenting because I'll see, and it's not really an HDF issue. It's very important. It's very a big FDF issue in my opinion because I see it in FDF. They bring musicians from Greece and they use five musicians to play everything, which is hard to do because you can't do you can't do more than with a clarinet and accordion. You just can't. Like it has to have a guy, then it has to have an accordion, and and they're confined to that thing. And that's why it's very important to ask ask around, ask musicians. What is the best thing? If you're going to do kithira, like you're going to do violi lauto, you don't need to do berlaki. Like you, it's very important to ask those questions to the musicians, and that'll kind of help you. That'll help you too in your question too, Michael. That if it can be played on those instruments, then then improvisation, improvisation or whatever can all be done. Whatever you need, if you got the right instruments, that's I guess that answers it a little bit. <laughs> Stacy, committee, thank you all. My apologies, but I have to drop off. I thank you all for attending, and I thank Nico, I thank Bobby, Sarando, and all my friends on here. It's great to see you all. I hope you're healthy and safe. And if you have any more questions that I can help with, please contact me, social media, or email. But thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much, Dimitri. Stay well. You too. Uh, just a note, too, um, to have a look at the comments again when you have a chance. Um, 
Rana Lutzaki, who, um, as I mentioned earlier, she was one of our presenters last time. She mentioned that there's a database on, on Thrace in Eastern Macedonia, and she gives the web address there. Is that for music, I guess? I don't know if she's still on. Um, but thank you for that. I'm going to take kind of a last call for questions or and or um, if the guys on the panel have anything that they feel like is burning in their soul that that we all need to know about live music um, that you'd like to share because I think that's important too. you guys are at the heart of, of, of that. It's so often. A comment. Yeah, please. Uh, no, I just want to go back to what uh, Dimitri said who just left about, you know, I think he was, it was Dimitri who talked about like, oh, there's more than one Zonarazico that you could play. I, I think there's a problem with some of the, not a problem, but a lot of um, uh, directors and teachers for groups often present the dance, they teach a dance to one tune, one tune. And that's all they practice to is that one tune. It could be that one recording. And if it's a generic dance from a region, I find that cripples the kids. It, 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 they don't get. They don't know the dance outside of that one tune. They can play. The, they can play if, even if it's a tzamiko. If they learn to dance only to Anasaitos and someone plays Imagori uh, Pandrevet, uh, they won't know what to do. Some of them. <laughs> and not only that, but I've, I've come across this with um, one or two uh, directors in my many years, where I went to the practice sessions. They were teaching the kids to dance. They had decided ahead of time exactly what their suite was going to be. So not only they presented that one tune recorded, but they had cut it to the exact amount of minutes that they wanted the tune to be, that they want the kids to learn to dance to. Philosophically, that to me is outrageous. You should teach the kids how to dance first. I mean, teach this one dance, teach as many different tunes as you can find, slow, fast, long, short, whatever, to the point where if they're dancing to live music, they're not going to actually panic if the guy plays two minutes and 45 seconds instead of two minutes and 35 seconds worth of music, you know? They're going to know what to do. They're going to understand that they will, he'll stop at the end of a musical phrase and they will stop the dance too. But so many people, it's like, you know, it's like paint by numbers how they teach dance. And it's, it's just the wrong way of approaching it. So, and I see some of you laughing. <laughs> You're right. You're 100% right. That's the biggest Joe, we deal with it all the time. Yeah. Every time. Joe's getting virtual high fives from yeah. everybody. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was my two cents. <laughs> no, it's good. And you know, it, 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 Joe, it's on the front end. I think on the back end, too. I think one thing that sometimes, you know, the the event of HDF is so social and, and we, the kids, you know, they go off and they do their own thing sometimes, but the, that's why the Lenke are important too, because it does give them more of a, a little more of a real life context. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's important for them to go and just dance and not necessarily just request every song that they just perform because they know it to your point, um, but to try and to. And, and it's important at the Lenke that these kids watch the older people dance and not jump and create their own lines like oh we danced it like this let me create my own line and do this and bump into you and do that dance etiquette which is a whole other form that should be a form oh, that's something else and that was very prominent this year at fdf but we'll leave it at that <laughs> yeah, and that's no. how they learn right that's exactly how they learn sadan those when they yeah. listen to you all play exactly they, they and joe it goes to your point where if they only know one's on an article but then they see you know the tribal elders doing something else that's where they're actually that's where it needs to click i'm not sure if it does but that's where for that's me would be the first happen. place um followed up by you know their director going did you see did you did you did you but it's an education process we'll get there it is and our process is flip-flopped right i mean the kids back in the day would learn exactly that way in that real life context meanwhile we're teaching in the context of competition and then sprinkling in the other stuff so it's hard um, but but it is I think because. that exact element is what makes it so hard to play this gladia. Because we end up playing a zona arabico for three minutes. And if it's over three minutes, you know that Saraz is going to get bombarded by every kid that wants that zona arabico to turn into Cesto, even though he's playing Ebros. I mean, and then, you know, you always have uh, Malavisioti, just because. <laughs> exactly. We have Makedonia, we have brass out and they're asking for a karyotko. Like, I'm like, and that's just, uh, Exactly. Because we're a jukebox. Oh, no, it doesn't work like that. Right. And it's, 
it's exactly that. It's you know the, the groove is eliminated from the entire thing when we're learning only the show. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah, a couple of comments here about etiquette is true. And that could be, I mean, um, let's stay tuned for that. Another future forum on, on Dan's etiquette, that would be worthwhile for sure. And a lot of people could contribute. But I'm going to take this moment just to ask the panel guys if there are any final points you'd like to make or anything important that we didn't cover that you'd like to touch on before we wrap up today. Only a piece of advice, because this was my first year coming out as a director, and I'm also a musician, so I went nuts with music and i thought i had it all figured out from august don't send music until you're ready because i changed it on my guys like 20 times before i stuck to one thing that worked uh if you don't have it by november know that something's up something's going wrong something's going haywire ask for help uh generally by november you should have everything set for a performance or two performances that are in January. That's my best advice. Doing uh, 90 things at once. <laughs> no, that's super important to remember. Any other guys? I see Crystal gave us some advice in there to educate people on how to party and do the Glendia is the hardest. He thinks HDF does a great job. Thanks, Crystal. We're going to keep trying. Uh, thank you for being on too. Crystal was one of our original um, presenters a couple months ago. So thanks for joining us and uh, for all the contributions you've made to our program over the years too. But uh, with that, guys, um, we've been on for a couple of hours. So we, we had promised a hard end at five today. So I'm going to stick with that and just go back quickly and thank again our presenters, Nico and Bobby and Sarado and our amazing panelists, Mitsu and Yanni and uh, would be off. Thank you guys so much for not just for today, but for always. And um, the rest of you, thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. Stay well. I hope before long we'll be doing a live event that we can all uh, be together and dance together very, very soon. So look out for the the uh, the follow up with this, and I'll get you guys all the information you need. But in the meantime, feel free to reach out with anything. But best. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, well. thank, thank, yes. thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Well, everybody be well. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Stay away Thanks from uh, coronavirus. <laughs> All right. Time for a late afternoon swim. Uh, yeah. Enjoy, Joe. Enjoy. Enjoy, Joe. Yes. <laughs> enjoy. Do you want to send us out with a prayer quickly? Absolutely, absolutely. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord of mercy. Dear Lord, our God, thank you for giving us this day, allowing us to be here together. As we come together to share our passion through dance and hopefully in, in, in song to glorify your holy name, always now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Congratulations to you all. Thank you very much for your wonderful Turn presentations. Up. Thank you, Father. And to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <gasps> Love y'all. I'm telling you, everyone's got to, we got to send everyone to a Panahiti and they'll, they'll, they'll learn because they'll get kicked out if they don't do it right. So, you know, the Horiatis, they'll, they'll kick them out. Don't worry. Okay. And the father, we're looking forward for a new recipe, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. You got it. All right. Take care, everyone. God bless. Bye, all. Take care. Bye. Bye.